what questions should you ask the facility if you've decided to move your parent into an assisted living facility, a memory care facility, a skilled nursing? There are some things that we wouldn't have known, but we just had to learn the hard way. We're having a conversation about caring for aging parents who have dementia. It's important to say that we are not doctors or experts in any way. We're just two daughters who found ourselves in a position where we are having to care for aging parents and we were not prepared. Well, one of the main things that we found out is you got to find out how many workers are typically at the facility. There were times that we would show up and there was always supposed to be several caregivers in the building and we couldn't find anyone and that was distressing to us. Here's this horrible thing with dementia. You want to believe your parent mm -hmm. and then sometimes what they say just really doesn't make any sense. Mama would tell us that they would leave her in charge to babysit the rest of the residents and we were just thinking Absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, maybe they're just making her feel good. Yeah. You know, feel, you know yeah. they're giving, giving her, her a purpose. Yeah. <laughs> but then when we started going, and more and more we were realizing there was only one, if anybody, in the building, we got to thinking, is she right? I mean, is this yeah. what happens? Yeah. And sometimes that one person, that one caregiver that's in the building would be in the kitchen preparing the food because it's common practice for caregivers to play multiple roles. The kitchen staff could also be cleaning and they could also be Giving a bath. dispensing medicines. Mm -hmm. and, and so when there's only one person in the building and they're in the kitchen, that's not really helping if someone has rung the bell or pushed the buzzer and there's not enough help. During the COVID era, which is when both of our parents were in these facilities, staffing was a huge problem. And I think it still continues to be a problem for these types of facilities because the pay is not great. And particularly, um, depending on what state you're living in, it could be very low. Not only that, let's just be real. These wonderful ladies at the last place where Mama was, oh, yeah. they were doing things for her that she would have been mortified if mm -hmm. she had been really aware of what all was going on. Mm -hmm. But to think that they did that and they never complained about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. They always spoke to her in loving tones. But it's hard to find people who are willing to it's do a that. Call I think it's a calling for sure. Absolutely. I mean... We could do it for our parents. You might could do it for your parents, but the fact that these ladies are doing it for people who aren't their parents or their grandparents. For very little pay. Yeah, it, it's... It's humbling. It's humbling, and you can see why they don't have people lined up at the door wanting mm -hmm. to do these jobs, but so we, it's, we are thankful for them. It's, it's very important to establish before you move your parent to any one of these caregiver facilities, how many caregivers are on staff at any one particular time, and what their level of medical training is. It's easy to assume that when they're in a facility that there are going to be people with medical training on staff to provide for your parents. And this is not always the case. There is a variety of levels of training that goes on with each type of caregiver. Sometimes the caregivers that are on staff there to take care of your parent don't have any formal medical training. They may be wonderful, sweet people mm -hmm. and they may take care of, of your parent, but if it comes down to them needing something medical, they're gonna have to wait until someone can get there. It's important to know, is there an RN there? Right. Always. We were in one facility and they had multiple buildings and they would tell you that there was always an RN there, but they meant on campus. Right. Not in that building. That particular building. That became a big concern. As dementia progresses, you're going to find that your loved one is going to go through all kinds of stages. Mm -hmm. They're going to become people that you don't recognize, recognize, whether it's because they're so agitated and angry, they're so fearful and afraid, or they are just the sweetest things mm -hmm. ever. And
that's a wonderful stage, but yeah. when they're going through some of the others where they're so fearful, when there's not an RN there that can give them something to help calm them down, mm -hmm. when they have fallen mm -hmm. and you have to go through an act of Congress to get them a Tylenol, is there an RN there? A question that your parent might have, because this was true of mama, and then we came to find out it was true of most of the people in the facility, they are very concerned about their laundry. Who is going to, to wash their clothes? Are their clothes being washed with other people's clothes? Mm -hmm. Or are they washed just separately? Do they just only wash certain people's clothes? That was a big concern. And also at mealtime, mama would whisper to me, do you have any money? I, I don't, how do I pay for this? Mm -hmm. And I would have to reassure her it was, it was already taken, taken care, care, of. care of. And she would say, Oh, it is, and it would it would relax her enough to where she might could eat something. Mm -hmm. And I noticed this not just with Mama, but other residents that were there would have the same reaction, wanting to pay to the point where Daddy would tip just for bringing them their meal, their meal, <laughs> yeah. because his back was so bad he couldn't get up and walk to the dining room. He was from the generation that yeah. you, you, you take care, care of, of the people. people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now another thing that's important to take into consideration. Jenny and I went to many facilities to scope them out ahead of time, mm -hmm. and we were appalled at the wallpaper. Oh, the decor. And, oh, and the curtains did not match the wallpaper. Oh, and we were like, Mama and, would never uh, allow this. Yeah. She would not be comfortable in yeah. a situation where the, the curtains did not match the wallpaper. And, and let alone that, have a roommate? Oh, yeah, no. No, no, if it no. wasn't Daddy, we were going to put her in a room with someone else. Oh, I mean, yeah. Well, again, the second best piece of advice that we were given mm -hmm. was a private room is for you, mm -hmm. not your parent. The decor is for you, not your parent, because there's a point when the powers of observation are very limited and they're not going to notice the decor. And someone even pointed out the older decor is what is familiar to them. Don't make their room into a place that's Trendy with the latest. And, yeah, yeah. Because that's not going to be comfortable for them. And this also makes it difficult when choosing exactly what level of care your parent might need. If we had put mama where she ended up, mm -hmm. it would have been too soon. If we had put her there first, yeah. it would have been too soon. Now, what did that mean for us? It meant we had to move multiple her. moves. Mm -hmm. I would gladly do that, but I would also reiterate, look for places that have more than one type of care. They will ultimately progress in their need for different types of care. Another thing I think is important to ask is will the staff members help with the things like turning on the TV or finding their phone? The types of things that we would do if we were there around the clock, but when we're not there, they are very frustrated if they can't watch TV because that's really the All only thing do. that they have to do because the things that they were used to doing to pass time reading, doing Sudoku, jigsaw, do, puzzles. jigsaw pu crossword puzzles. Either their vision was limited and they couldn't do that anymore or their cognitive. Or the uh, de dexterity. Of the dexterity with their hands, hands, with the arthritis, was prevented them from doing some of the knitting, some of the things they'd always done. And so when there is something that they can do, like watch TV, and they can't turn the remote on, it's important to know that the staff member will come in there and help with it. Some of the facilities where we were, the staff was fabulous. Even some of the business staff would come in and help get the TV going. But there were some facilities where they were like, this isn't my job. We provide dominoes in the other room. Yeah. And if she wants something to do, yeah. she can go play and dominoes. And just, you've got to, to do your homework and make sure you know, ask the right questions to find out how well the staff will attend to those tiny little needs that are really more important than they may seem on the surface. And don't be afraid to make a change if you need to. Yeah. In addition to finding out how many caregivers are there mm -hmm. and if there is an RN, you need to find out about 
the doctor yeah. that comes to visit the facility. And how often he comes to visit. Is it just one doctor for the entire facility? Can they have their own doctors come mm -hmm. in? We found ourselves in a situation where her hospice doctor was also the facility doctor, so that just happened to, to work out that mm -hmm. way for us. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the case. Sometimes for you may have two. But find out how often he is scheduled to visit the and patient. And be there. If you can, <laughs> yeah, because we were told the doctor would be on campus once a month. Unless he was called in for an emergency. The other part of that question is does that mean he will see my parent when he comes? Because what we discovered was that unless a nurse had noticed a problem and notified him, he wouldn't even stop by to check on right. her at his once a month vis yeah. visit. He would be in the building, Yeah, but he never laid eyes that on her. That was a surprise to me because I just assumed if he's coming by once a month, he's coming by to at least check on her. And I'm sure that I'm jumping ahead. We ended up putting Mama on hospice because not only did she have dementia, she was also diagnosed with cancer. Mm -hmm. And because of her age and condition, we were advised and we felt the same way that there was no reason to put her through the chemo, that chemo and radiation would be more detrimental than beneficial to her. When we made the decision to have her on hospice, we at least had the comfort of thinking that the doctor would see her once a month. Mm -hmm. And then when we found out that wasn't the case, we wish that we had... Considered another alternative, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure that we regret putting her on hospice. Oh, no. Because that can be a very wonderful option for many people. It just our particular case didn't turn out that way. Well, do your research on hospices yeah. as well. That is also a topic for another, for another video because it's so extensive and it's important. Not only do you need to know how often the doctor will come, find out how to get in touch with the RN or the doctor after hours because invariably when there was a problem, when there was a major fall or a major accident or a Extreme major come apart, pain. Yeah. it would happen on the weekend or at night or just on a Friday morning because every doctor office closes at 11. And so we weren't always able to get in touch with the RN or the doctor when we needed them. So find out, make sure you've got a phone number to contact. And what we found out is that they rarely give out their cell phone, and I can understand that. So you were relegated to calling the facility and then the facility, if they got around to it, would contact a nurse who may call you back. And in some cases for us, it was weeks after we made the call before they ever got back to us. Those types of things can be really challenging and they were trials for us. Our mother started falling a lot. The more her dementia took over, the more she began to fall. And we were told, this is what's going to happen. She's going to fall and there's just nothing you can do about it, which is extremely difficult to watch. We'll share what we did as we continue our conversation about caring for parents with dementia in episode five of this series. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you won't miss a thing.